Today we're very pleased to welcome Aaron H. Savas to Bite Or to discuss about his life and art. A bisexual Mexican-American writer, Aaron released his first published YA novel, This is Why They Hate Us, in August 2022. Congratulations. Thank you so very much for taking the time to talk to us. We know you are very busy these days. So how are you? I'm good. I, I, I'm really excited to do this because, you know, it's bisexual.org. Like, it's awesome. legit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so very much. So just to start things, how do you come to identify as bi? Could you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, so it was a tricky process. I think much trickier than if I had been, you know, gay. Growing up, I liked girls and didn't really question anything for, for a little bit. And then when I hit puberty, all of a sudden I started sort of having these weird feelings about men. Like I couldn't really process them. I couldn't really say at the time I like men. I, I just didn't know how to process it because it was different from how I felt about girls. Um, I, I had always liked girls my age. And then when I hit puberty, it was like, no, like grown men. Chris Evans in the Fantastic Four movie, like when he's in, oh. he has like this, this pink jacket wrapped around his lower waist. And I just remember seeing his like chest hair and being like, oh, what is like, I was really confused when I started you know, realizing what that meant, I would sort of flip flop. And I was like, oh no, I'm straight, but I just, I'm curious. And then I'd be like, oh no, I'm gay. Like I, you know, I'm just pretending to be attracted to girls and I don't feel that way. I can't feel that way about them. I kept moving between the two because obviously one of those was more desirable at the time because of, you know, growing up pretty religious. And then I got to college and I slowly, in a lot of ways I changed. When I first got to college, I was pre-med. Um, and obviously now I'm like a novelist and a creative writing professor. And then the other thing too is like, I got to campus and I was like, I'm straight. And then, you know, it was a process of realizing that there was, there, there were more options out there. Junior year, I, I finally, I came out to myself. And I always say the first and only coming out you need to do is to yourself. Everything else after that is just, you know, sort of your choice. So what has been your experience as a bi artist and writer specifically? Have you found acceptance in your community and workspaces? It's definitely hard to find representation. When I was writing this book, I, I don't think I had read a book about a bi boy, a bi Latino boy, and especially right. a bi Latino boy written by a bi Latino man. I was always finding parts of myself, but I, I, I couldn't always find something that made me just think, oh yeah, this is totally me. And that's why I was writing it. I wanted a book to exist that could sort of reflect not everyone's experiences, not every bi Latino boys, but at least mine. Luckily, I didn't experience a lot of pushback on it being queer in general, except for myself. When I first wrote the book, I wrote it very quickly. I, I wrote it in a month. At the end of it, I, I was just like, oh, what do I do with it? I, I revealed a lot of like myself in it, what I was attracted to, what, you know, some experiences I had had, even though it was a, it's about a 17 year old kid, like I was, I felt 17 when I was 24 because it was my first time dating men, getting to know men in this way. I didn't send it to agents at first because I was like, like, I don't want my first book to be one that my grandma can't read because he's going to talk about his crushes and his urges and his, his feelings about boys. How did you become interested in writing? What captivated you about this artistic expression? I've always loved reading. I got really obsessed with reading in elementary school. Um, but the thing at the time is I only read books about animals. So Warrior Cat <laughs> series, Guardians of Gahul with the owls, uh, Red Wall. I loved reading so much. I did try to write my first book when I was nine years old. It did not go well. I did not end up finishing it. And then it wasn't until college that I started again. I started writing the screenplay that in my head, I called it Mean Guys because it really was just a rip off of Mean Girls. It was about this kid who just got popular. But the funny thing, going back to what I said earlier, I was straight at the time and I wrote this novel where this kid is straight, but he gets into the most homoerotic situations that you could ever possibly imagine. I'm quote unquote straight, I'm writing this straight character. He becomes friends with the star quarterback and throughout the whole book, it's just like, no homo, no homo, no homo, like that sort of thing. Right. But at one point he's underneath the bed while the football player is on top of the bed with his girlfriend. And it's just like, I'm like, how did you not know? But I did, but I was in denial. It was, it was a whole complicated thing. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I really got back into it in college. So yeah, but it, but it really started with, being nine years old and trying to write a book. Now, what do you find inspiration from? How do you decide what topics to write about? 
Well, it's not really a decision. I think when I feel the urge to write, it's kind of like the urge to pee <laughs> or, you know, to drink or to eat or whatever. It's like, you have to just satisfy it. I've had a, a, a beautiful sentence just like kind of drop into my head. So when I do write, when I have a character in mind, that's how it started with Kike. I heard his internal monologue and I just sat down and I was like, I was writing while I was typing what he was thinking. And sometimes it's inner monologue. Sometimes it's dialogue. Sometimes it's a premise. I finished writing a rom-com last year. It's about an author who like one of his book characters comes to life, but he's a, he's a romance author. And so it's like his ideal man. It's kind of like a Pygmalion story. It's funny because you mentioned Kiki's dialogue and one of my favorite things about This Is Why They Hate Us is the main character Kike and his inner dialogues. Because man, he's so mean, like I'm, I'm the same way. So it made me laugh and realize how crazy is that overthinking can take you places. Does your sexuality influence your approach to writing or just in that particular novel? In this novel, for sure. Like you said, Kike has an intersectional identity. He's Latino and he's bi. He also struggles with mental health issues. There's a lot about him, right? Like, and you have to have that with a main character. They have to be complex and interesting and well-rounded. With him, I knew I had to make a choice in terms of what I was going to focus on. Because, you know, with, with a coming of age story, usually there's a realization at the end where it's like, oh, this is how I accept this part of myself. And with This Is Why They Hate Us, I knew I was going to be focusing on his sexuality. There's plenty that I have to say about being, like growing up Mexican, growing up in East LA, cultural things, specifically being Chicano, because I was born in the US, my parents were born in the US, my grandparents were born in the US. We've been here a while, but we obviously know our heritage and know how other people treat us because of that heritage. So there is a lot that I would have liked to explore with Kike's ethnicity. It took a backseat definitely to his bisexuality. I knew I wanted him to already have come out to himself. I wanted him to accept that he was bi. I wanted at least one other person to know, and that's his best friend Fabiola in the book. But I didn't want it to be like a realizing he was bi story because it's a lot more fun if he already knows it and we can kind of skip to him right. being like, I like this guy, I like this guy, I like this guy. And then, you know, seeing what that says about being bisexual. Whether you want to or not, as an author, you're going to hear feedback on your book from various sources. People would say that I was sort of reinforcing my stereotypes. I'm writing about my own identity. I wanted to acknowledge the real ramifications if you don't have a family that totally understands what you are. In your book also, Kike deals with having religious parents. And when they learn he's bi, they decide to ditch their religious beliefs to support him. It's something that also has happened to me. It was something that helped me a lot, knowing and feeling the support of my family. So how was your experience coming out to your parents? I read somewhere you also grew up in a religious household. Was it a similar experience as Kike's? So my parents met in a kingdom hall. Their parents and, and them kind of, they were Jehovah's Witnesses. But over the course of time, like my dad sort of became an atheist and my mom, um, along with my grandma, they became born again Christians. Growing up, I would go to Sunday school sometimes, freshman year of high school, going to church and hearing my pastor say like, drug addicts, I accept you, I love you, you know, with God in your life, all is possible. And then he'd make like a joke or something about trans or gay people. I was like, oh, that's not me. I would feel that, that judgment. And it felt like mm. queerness was a particular sin, like an unforgivable one. I was trying so desperately to just not feel the way I felt. I, I told you it was a long process to come out to myself and I'm like, what does that mean for me and my family? The first person I came out to was my best friend who was the inspiration for Fabiola. And the second person I came out to was my mom. Because even though my mom was very religious, there's no one on earth who loves me more. I knew I could tell her and I knew we would just kind of work on it together. So I told her and, you know, she's like, I still love you and, you know, you're fine, whatever. Like I. Basically like I know also, <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool. That doesn't have to be too hard. I didn't really come out to my dad. We stopped speaking around that time. So that's that was like nine years ago, but I think he, he probably knew too. And then it was just a very gradual coming out process where it's like one person at a time sort of thing until I came out like on all my social media at 25. The thing about writing a book that's really funny is you'll put something in there and it will just be like edited out. And one of the things that I edited out was the fact that Kika's parents are 34. So Kika is 17, they're 34. They had him when they were 17, which is, 
you know, wild to me, but that happens, especially where I grew up. I knew with his parents that they were very young. And since Kika's Gen Z, they were going to be like closer to my age and my understanding of sexuality. They're not going to be like, get out of my house. But I knew they were going to have some issues with it because like I said in the book, they only go for Christmas and Easter. That's when they go to church. That's it. But they still have this, these beliefs and they still have their parents who instilled in them these, you know, certain values or beliefs. I wanted their reaction to not be perfect, but also not outright homophobic. I wanted to write coming out scenes that I hadn't seen before. One of the things uh, um, about the book that I like, because there are so many quotes, I cannot decide which is my favorite one, but there's <laughs> one in particular uh, where Kike has like a really big moment of revelation towards the end of the novel and says that bi people are mythical creatures. Is it because we're invisible to some people or what was the reason you, you put that quote in there? Yeah, so I mean, one of the prevailing modes of biphobia is by bi erasure, right? And it's this for idea sure. that, that for bi men, people believe we're gay. And with bi women, people mm -hmm. believe they're straight among gender lines, like that's how it goes for bi people. Yeah, when I had that line, it was, the idea that bi people don't exist and yet we do and that's why like people will call bisexual people unicorns because it's like mm. everyone knows that a unicorn is but they don't exist part of my response sometimes to biphobia is to sort of just embrace it and be like well you know i'm gonna make the joke before you can i'm also gonna make you aware that you're wrong with that line it was it was really about like sort of acknowledging the biphobia and the bi erasure and to just be like, yeah, I mean, we're mythical creatures. You know, like that sort of joke about pretending something doesn't exist when it very obviously does. And so that's what I wanted to acknowledge with that line. Now, another moment I really liked, that was when I connected with the title of your book, mm. is when Kike and Salim talk about religion and how they struggle with feeling accepted. How do you decide on the title? For, for your novel. Uh, is that something that you decided particularly? Before I went to grad school, everything I wrote, I had a title for it. I liked the title. I believed in the title. I went to grad school. My classmates would be like, this is a bad title for your short story. And then so at a certain point, I just stopped titling things. And I would ask my classmates, like, can you think of a title for me? I wrote This Is Why They Hate Us before grad school. So when I had that title, I was so sure of it. I was like, there's no way that this is not the title for the book. I wrote the first chapter. So in the first draft, Kike is in his room and it started with the line, my mom calls it playing with yourself, which is indisputably the worst name for it. And he goes on to talk about self-pleasure. Then he starts thinking about like his crushes and he has these three, right? That's kind of, that's the plot of the book. I, I finished the chapter and I was kind of sitting there and I was like, just based off two aspects of Kike's identity, people already hate him. And this was also like 2017, newly after Trump became president. The fact that he is Mexican, the fact that he likes boys, like people already hate him. He's just a kid in his room thinking about his crushes and people hate him. And so in my mind, it was just like, oh, this is why they hate us. And then my agent was like, hey, we're probably gonna have to revisit the, the title. And I was like, why? And she was like, well, it doesn't fit too well. You wrote like this raunchy, rom-com the title feels too dark it feels like an issue book you know something like the hate you give by angie thomas and i was like well that's my title the disconnect between the nature of the book and the title is homophobia it's kind of making that point of like this kid is like you know doing his version of american pie or super bad and because of that people hate him so this is why they hate us so i'm sort of pointing the finger at people and being like this is why you hate us we sell the book and my editor says, I have concerns about the title. And, you know, we're putting together an announcement to put in Publishers Marketplace or Publishers Weekly or whatever. And she's like, should we think of a new title? And I was like, no, they pushed me on it. Like my editor kept coming back to me and saying, marketing does not like it, does not like the, the disparity between the material and the title. We need to come up with something else. And not wanting to like rock the boat, not wanting to be ungrateful, I said, I will brainstorm some new titles. And if I find something I like better, obviously we'll go with that, but I don't think that's gonna be the case. One of them I liked was Two Kids in a Swimming Pool, um, which is about the book, cause it's, you know, over the course of summer and they swim a lot, but I, I liked it cause it's a like, ocean reference. One of his songs, he says, Two Kids in a Swimming Pool. The one that they ended up loving was Don't Ask Me How I Feel before, 
they change it to something I don't want, I have to make my case one more time. And my editor called me and we had a long conversation and she was like, okay, we're gonna keep This Is Why They Hate Us and, and that's it. What I didn't know at the time is she was leaving Simon & Schuster. That was her parting gift. She cemented the oh, title wow. and she said, the future editor can't make you change it, which I was very, very grateful for. Um, and we've kept the title and I, I always have to explain it, but I love explaining it because, you know, it, it really did mean a lot to me. And I do think it, it really stands out, you know, versus don't ask me how I feel or two kids in a swimming pool. Do you feel that living authentically has opened up new opportunities in your life? Honestly, yeah. Like I, I feel this kinship with queer authors. The most supportive authors have been queer people, obviously. Like they have championed me and, and I, I feel like they really get the book in a way that you won't always if you're not part of the in-group. To have queer men especially, like queer male authors, to have them read it and say like, oh, I really felt this and I, I identify with this, like that, that means the world to me. I wrote this book for queer boys and queer boys who grew up and became queer men. And so I wanted like my experiences to just be front and center and I wanted to center queer boys and men because there were so many points, like I could have done it to myself when I was drafting, I could have listened to certain things that my agent or my editor said. I could have listened to uh, reviewers before, like, cause you know, people review the book before it actually comes out. Like I could have, you know, taken these notes at, at any point, but I, I, I really tried to have my compass pointing to, to myself. What, what about writers? Cause I don't have any on my radar. One of my favorite YA novels of all time, I mentioned Adam Silvera. My favorite book from him is not They Both Die at the End. My favorite book from him is More Happy Than Not. It's about a queer Latino kid um, growing up in the Bronx. And there were just all these points of connection where it was like, okay, queer Latino, same, lives in the Bronx, which I, you know, I, I've lived in New York and I've been to the Bronx a lot. The main character's name is also Aaron. He lives in a world where uh, this brain surgery exists that can suppress your memories or thoughts. So he kind of thinks about erasing someone that he likes who is a boy. Um, really, really good. 1500 Miles from the Sun by Johnny Garcia, a fellow uh, Chicano Mexican writer, just an incredible contemporary book about this Mexican kid who accidentally comes out on Twitter and then his uh, social media crush, uh, hops into his DMs and they have like a long distance flirtation before he visits him. Uh, incredible. Like a Love Story by Opti Nazemian is incredible. It takes place in the 80s during the AIDS epidemic and it's just a really beautiful story and it has three perspectives. It's one of my favorite YA books as well. And last but not least, we have a short story collection for adults and it's called Gordo um, by Jaime, Jaime Cortez. Um, and this one, I mean, with any short story collection, I feel like some stories I really like and then some other ones I'm like, eh, they're fine. Um, but I just highly recommend there are some queer Latino stories in here that I just, I really enjoy. And I'll stop there. Mm, I, could, a, I could keep going, but I'll stop there. Besides that, is there any uh, surprising fact about you that you would like to share? You want an exclusive? I went skydiving when I was 18. Okay, so the thing is, I'm, I'm terrified of heights. Like, I'm so scared Thanks. of heights. But I, I, I wanted very badly to conquer it and to just not be scared of heights anymore. But when I was 18, 19, I, I know I had graduated high school, but my friend who was the, this daredevil guy who didn't have that part of your brain that makes you scared of things, he really wanted to do it and he wanted me to do it with him. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. I'm never doing that again. I think it wasn't even the falling that was the worst part. It was the lead up. It was the anxiety before. Like, I remember I kept going to the bathroom to pee and nothing would come out because I didn't need to pee. I just felt like I had to because I was so anxious and nervous. Just one final question. I just wanted to know if you have any advice for people who have just came out as bi or what advice would you have given uh, a young Aaron before coming out? I would say, don't let anyone else tell you about yourself. I think I, I wasted so much time when I was newly bisexual and I still get dragged into these things at my, you know, big age of 30. People will, will tell me what I am. The other day I got a comment where someone said, do you honestly believe people believe you when you say you're bi? Do you honestly think you're fooling anyone? I think is what they said. And 
I just ignored it. <laughs> when I was younger and I was like newly by, I wasted so much time and energy and emotion just like trying to prove myself to people. And I think with bi men in particular, like we're pressured to objectify women and to sort of make our desires known and it ends up just like harming women because <laughs> uh, you know it's like well let me prove to you that i'm bi i'm gonna say this about this person or i'm gonna do this or, you know makes you into some, someone you're not so i would just focus on on just being you and doing your best to ignore when other people are trying to categorize you or sum you up in some way that you don't agree with finding books like yours stories like yours makes me really really happy and i thank you so much for that and i thank you so much for the advice also it was like a really good advice thank you so much for for reading the book and, and taking the time and asking the questions and i love it so. thank you